It is a good day to jump into God's Word together. So if you've got your Bible or your app, go ahead and open to Esther chapter 3. Nick uh, read the first six verses, but we're going to look at the whole chapter together this morning. Now Esther is a little book in the Old Testament. It's got ten chapters in it. And as a structure, uh, the first three chapters are sort of the setting, the introduction And after those three chapters unfolds the meat of the story in the next seven chapters. And so as we look at chapter three this morning, what we're really doing is finishing the introduction to the book. And so up to this point, we've met three of the four main characters, main players in the story of Esther. Uh, There are two royals and their two royal advisors, okay? So we've met Queen Esther. She rose to the throne after the first queen, Vashti, fell from the favor of King Ahasuerus. So she's the first royal. Her royal advisor happens to be her cousin-turned-adoptive father, Mordecai. All right, he adopted Esther um, after she had lost her parents sometime in her childhood. And he loved her and cared for her and raised her. And that care and that connection was maintained even after she became queen. So Queen Esther and uh, Mordecai are both Jews. That means they are people of God. But they're not living in God's promised land They're living in exile in the capital city of the Persian Empire. And that's kind of a segue to the other two main characters of the book. The other royal is King Ahasuerus. All right, his great-grandpa was Cyrus the Great, who kind of took Persia from a kingdom, like other kingdoms, into empire status. And then Cyrus the Great's son, Darius the First, expanded the empire to pretty much the entire known world at the time, except Greece. Somehow the Greeks held out against his rule. And then after Darius the First came King Ahasuerus, or sometimes he's known by his Greek name, Xerxes. Now, Xerxes was uh, upset at the Greeks for not letting his father rule over the whole known world. And so he made it his goal to avenge his father's loss and fight the Greeks. There was a famous battle uh, at Thermopylae where somewhere between half a million and two million Persian soldiers fought against 300 valiant Spartans. And there was a movie that commemorated that. I'm not recommending children watch that movie, but that's the event, okay? So you've got King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, who rules over the empire of the known world, and he's upset at the Greeks. And so Esther chapter 1 takes us into one of the king's banquets. And here's what it says. In the third year of his reign, he... That's Ahasuerus, gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and the governors of the provinces were before him. So the book starts with a banquet and on the guest list are nobles and officials and army leaders and governors. It's like he's gathering the influential people of the empire preparing for war. These are the leaders he needed on his side so that he could go to war against the Greeks. This is a war council that's happening. (laughs) And if you're an emperor who's planning to lay siege to the only people in the known world who are not under your command, and at the same time you're having to put out rebellions that are cropping up because you've raised taxes across the empire to pay for your war, you've got a lot on your hands And you're likely going to have to delegate some of the management of the rest of the empire to someone else. And that's what we see happen in Esther chapter 3. We meet King Ahasuerus, royal advisor. His name is Haman. He's appointed as second in command over the whole 
kingdom. Now, I don't know when you read about Haman what comes into your mind, but for me, in my mind, we go back to uh, the Disney movie Aladdin. And you remember there's a sultan, and he has a grand vizier, Jafar, right? A grand advisor, Jafar, and he's like a thin, tall, wicked man with a, with a twisty goatee. And he's a, a, he uses his position of power to influence um, and advance his own wicked agenda. <laughs> That's it, right there. So whenever I think about uh, Haman... The Bible doesn't tell us what he looks like, but that's what I picture, okay? Long, twisty goatee and all. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so I look like an Oompa Loompa, now we got Doug too. That's what we're doing this morning. Um, okay, in chapter 3, verse 6 tells us that the events happen in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus' reign, okay? So Queen Esther was appointed queen in the seventh year. Five years later, Haman is promoted to second in command. That means for five years, there's like this honeymoon season for Esther and Mordecai, where, where Queen Esther gets to reign for five years. At this point, she's the longest serving queen King Ahasuerus has ever had. She's gotten some trust and influence in those years. They were good for Mordecai too. He had gotten a position in the king's court, sitting at the king's gate, where he would get to keep tabs on Esther uh, day by day. And so he also had some influence for five years. There's really nothing notable that happens in life for Esther and Mordecai in the Persian capital city really isn't all that bad. It's a honeymoon. I mean, imagine for us today, I think about this, five years of nothing notable happening at all. <laughs> like in our world, there's like world-changing events that happen like every week. It's exhausting. Can you imagine five whole years of nothing on the news except the weather? You know, like, this is a honeymoon for these guys. Life is not all that bad for them. But the thing about honeymoon seasons like that is, oftentimes you don't know you're in them until they're over. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I had a friend who, um, he got a job, he's changing careers, and he got a job at an insurance agency, and he was going to build his book of business totally from scratch. And so they, they kind of recruited him, and they made this sound like his dream job. He was going to uh, get er unlimited earning potential. The only limit was the amount of effort he was willing to put in. And then they said, and, and to put a cherry on top of this, we will even give you a subsidy for your income until your business is like self-sustaining. So he got extra cash while he was building his business. Um, he's like, I think this is what I want. I'm all in. And so he gets started with them. And a few months in, he gets his paycheck. And guess what? <laughs> no extra dollars <laughs> at all. And so he calls in. And it turns out in the fine print of the agreement that he'd signed, those extra dollars only lasted as long as he was hitting every growth benchmark that they had set for him. And after the first few months, they accelerated pretty rapidly and he just didn't keep up. And so what was pitched as unlimited earning potential turned into a job that didn't even pay like a part-time wage. So the honeymoon ended and he never saw it coming. And that's what happens here for Esther and Mordecai. They're in this honeymoon season. Life in Persia has been really pretty good for them for five years. And then Haman gets promoted and it all ends. Haman brings into full force what the story of Esther has only hinted at until this point. The world is a hostile place for people who are not of this world. Now, if you know me as a preacher, I usually preach three-point sermons, and we just go one, two, three. I'm switching it up today, all right? One-point sermon, this is it. The world is a hostile place for people who are not of this world. This morning, I thought, we'll just look at what that meant for Esther and Mordecai in the Bible in their times, 
And then we'll see what it means for us in our day. So that's where we're going. Let's jump back into the text. Esther 3 begins like this. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And so right away, we learn two things about Haman. Number one, he was promoted by the king. All right, he was advanced above everybody else except the king himself. Now, Esther is a story of redemption through falling and rising. And so if you start out the book, if your introduction puts you up here, that does not bode well for you for the rest of the book. All right, so keep that in mind as we read. Haman started high, and it's kind of a book of reversals. But what we see for now is Haman is right where he wants to be. He is at the top of his game, number two over the whole empire. The first thing we learn about Haman, he was promoted by the king. The second thing we learn is who he is, his background. He's introduced as Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha. Hamadatha, who is he? He's Haman's dad, right? We don't know anything else about him. My little neighbor girl, um, she always calls me Ivor's dad. So sometimes that's just all you know, you know? Um, Hamadatha, he's Haman's dad. Uh, The other thing we learn about who Haman is, is that he is an Agagite, all right? Now, that we do know something about. The Agagites have a long, contentious, hostile history with the people of God. It's like the Sharks and the Jets, or the Montagues and the Capulets, the Hatfields and the McCoys, the people who squeeze the toothpaste tube from the center, and the people who squeeze the toothpaste tube from the bottom, right? They are just different, and they do not get along. Nobody else? Nobody else has that tension in their world? Okay, just me. They don't get along. Let me show you some of this tension in Scripture. We'll start in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul is king over God's people and his promised land. And the kingdom of God is taking root. It's the first king. And as Saul comes into his own, as he's reigning as king over Israel, he has some hard fighting with the enemies of God who remain in the promised land. King Agag of the Amalekites is one of those enemies. So, when we think Haman the Agagite, we think King Agag. All right, the Agagites come from King Agag. Agag was an Amalekite. So they sound the same for our purposes today. They just are the same. You hear Amalekite, you can think Agagite. All right, Um, so they've got this long history. Back in Saul's day, um, the Agagites were enemies of God. This is what God told King Saul. I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Devote to destruction means totally wipe them out. God tells King Saul, Saul, I remember what Agag's people did to my people way back when they were leaving slavery in Egypt. I have not forgotten, and now is judgment time it's consequences and so let's go back to deuteronomy and see what exactly they did when the people left egypt here's what the bible says remember what amalek did to you on the way as you came out of egypt how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail those who were lagging behind you and he did not fear god therefore When the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around you, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, that's essentially where King Saul is. He's been given the promised land, the kingdom is being established. What should happen when Israel gets to that point? God goes on, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. So here's the timeline, the history of the Amalekites and Israelites. When when Israel is leaving Egypt, they're walking through the desert. It's hot. It's exhausting. 
And as they're exhausted walking away from Egypt, here come the Amalekites with a sucker punch attack from the back. And you know who they picked off? The weakest and the most fatigued in the back of the caravan of Israel. It was a sucker punch, cowardly attack. And they killed the people of God when they were at their weakest. And guess what? God did not take kindly to that. And so he gave them a great victory over the Amalekites that day. And then he said, I will not forget this. Fast forward a few centuries. King Saul is reigning over Israel. And guess who shows up? King Agag of the Amalekites. And he again attacks God's people and God doesn't like it. He says, I remember what they did. So Saul, now you go attack them and devote them to destruction. Completely wipe them out. And you know what Saul did? He went to battle and he had great victory over the Amalekites and he viciously killed King Agag, but he did not wipe them out. And so fast forward another 500 years, and we see Haman, the Agagite, rise to second in command in the kingdom of Persia. And at the same time, we see Mordecai, the Benjaminite, which, interestingly enough, is the very same tribe that, the, uh, that King Saul came from. And so this has a long history. You see Haman, the Agagite, Mordecai, the Benjaminite, and the early readers would have just seen those associations and thought, this means trouble. Those peoples hate each other. There's been hostilities for maybe a thousand years. This is a long-running thing, and it is not going to go well. Now, I point all that out. But I want to nuance the point that I'm making, all right? This long-standing hostility doesn't mean that every Agagite was one of God's enemies. I think it means instead that the prevailing worldview of the Agagites was hostile to the people of God. We see exceptions to these prevailing worldviews if we make generalizations or paint with broad strokes. We see exceptions to that stuff all the time. Like we just studied Ruth, uh, ended that last month, and in Ruth, it's the Moabites that are the enemies of God's people. They hate God's people, but Ruth didn't. She was an exception. She left Moab behind to follow God and loved him and became one of the women in the lineage of Jesus. We see an exception. We see uh, uh, Romeo Montague. His family hated the Capulets, but he didn't. He fell in love with one. My own wife does not follow the instructions on the toothpaste tube, and she squeezes from the middle. And guess what that means for me? I have to squeeze up from the bottom every morning because the instructions say that is more efficient extraction. Okay? And guess what? I don't hate her. I love her. We're different, but we get along, all right? We see exceptions to these rules all the time. What I want to say here is there is a danger in this world to see people who are not like us, who don't share our worldview as our enemies by default. We're prone to mock them, vilify them, even dehumanize them. And friends, I want to say this morning, that is not what Jesus did. In Jesus' last hours, the religious leaders of his day put him through a sham trial and sent him to the political leaders of his day who who convicted him uh, and sentenced him to death by crucifixion, even though they knew they did not have evidence against him that was sufficient for a sentence like that. And so Jesus, after a sham trial and an unfair sentencing, was nailed to the cross. And as he hung on that cross, he looked down at his executioners, and this is what he said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was a fantastic embodiment of Jesus' own teaching. He taught his disciples saying, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high. Why? 
Why does doing good to your enemies make you a son of the Most High? Because it's like God. Jesus continued, For he, the Most High, God, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. The point I want to make here is that the world is a hostile place for people who are not of this world. Jesus' response was not to return hostility for hostility or hate for hate. Instead, he loved his enemies and he tells his followers to do the same. Back to Esther chapter 3, all right? Uh, Haman, the Agagite, is promoted to second in command over the whole empire. And the Bible continues telling the story like this. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Now this is where the central conflict of the book of Esther begins. Everybody bows to Haman except Mordecai. Uh, On first read, it's kind of easy to assume that Mordecai might have had some, like, righteous motivation. Like, I'm not going to bow to anybody except my God alone. And we could all say, yeah, right? Like, we might assume that's what he's doing, but I just don't think that's what the evidence says. Because Mordecai, uh, he's in the court of King Ahasuerus, another pagan king who is not God. And guess what? The Bible doesn't say anything about Mordecai not bowing to him. In fact, if Mordecai refused to bow to King Ahasuerus, there is no chance he sits in the court of the king. And so uh, there's also evidence that when Mordecai refuses to obey this particular command of the king to bow to Haman, that, that confuses all of his buddies who are in the court too. They ask him, hey, why aren't you obeying this command? Implying that he obeys all the other commands of the king. It's unusual that he disobeys this one. So the evidence says uh, Mordecai doesn't refuse to bow to anyone in general or to follow the laws of the kingdom in general. He just refuses this law to bow to this man, Haman the Agagite. And from the history, we can maybe understand what's going on in his heart. Righteous or not, that's the decision he made. And when Haman found out, he did not take it well. All right, here's what the Bible says. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus interesting. Haman himself doesn't even notice that Mordecai doesn't bow. You get the idea that his chin is so high, he doesn't even see who's bowing and who's not bowing. And so it's Mordecai's friends. They go up and say, hey, hey, Haman, have you noticed Mordecai refuses to bow? And when he looks down, he is furious. He's Filled with anger. He's overcome with madness. And he responds with the same dramatic exaggeration that all the other king's advisors respond with. So if you remember, I said there are four main characters in this story. On one hand, you've got Esther and Mordecai, people of God. On the other hand, you have King Ahasuerus and Haman. And they both, they sort of model for us life in those kingdoms. And so if you remember King Ahasuerus, when he commanded his first queen, Vashti, hey, come here, wearing maybe only your crown so all my buddies can see your beauty, and she refused. You remember what his advisors did? They said, oh, king, man, here's what's going to happen. If if the 
men, uh, if the men and women of the empire find out that the queen has disrespected the king and refused to listen to him, then all of the wives of all of the husbands of all the 127 provinces that stretch across all the land from India to Ethiopia, if they find out not one of them will ever respect her husband again. It is a dramatic, exaggerated response. And when Haman hears Mordecai won't bow, he gets the same fury and the same impulsive, dramatic, exaggerated response. It goes on in him. He sees Mordecai and thinks, it's not enough. I want to kill that guy. And it's not enough just to kill him. I want to kill anybody else that might think like he thinks. I'm going to kill all the Jews. And so Haman makes a plan. And it's kind of a weird plan. He takes, he casts lots, think like rolls the dice, to pick a month and a day when he's going to tell everyone in the kingdom to annihilate the Jews. And so he does that. He rolls the dice. He picks his day. And then he goes to the king and says this. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So Haman heads into the king, and he doesn't tell the truth, does he? He says there's a people scattered abroad, their laws are different, and they don't follow your laws. None of these people follow any of your laws. That's what Haman said, but that's not true. That's an exaggeration. There is one Jew who doesn't obey one law. Dramatic exaggeration. And then he offers consequences for this disobedience. It is not a fair trial. It is not a punishment that fits the crime He says, therefore, let's kill them all. Genocide. He's exaggerated the response to an exaggerated accusation. And then he sweetens the deal. And guess what, king? I'll pay you 10,000 talents of silver to do it. That is a lot of money. One commentator said there's a good chance that 10,000 talents of silver was like 60% of the total tax revenue of the whole empire for a year. So imagine if you go to the president to lobby for your cause and put $2.2 trillion behind it. It's a corrupt but all too often effective strategy. That's what Haman does, and the Bible says it was effective. It goes on. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day. (laughs) The 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. So the chapter ends with couriers delivering instructions to everyone across the whole empire to prepare to annihilate the people of God. The world is a hostile place for people who are not of this world. I'm not going to lie, as a preacher, that's a hard place to end, (laughs) right? Like, annihilation decree, have a great week, everybody, you know? Um... And so I can't just end there. I don't want to give away the whole book. But as we continue through Esther, we are going to see that God is an incredible protector of his people. And history is indeed in God's hands. But at this point in the story, God's people don't know how things are going to turn out. They only know that Haman and King Ahasuerus have put a target on their backs. The world is a hostile place for people who are not of this world. That was true in the days of Mordecai and Esther, and I think it's true in our days too. The hostility can take different shapes. Like there are some places in our world today where you can be killed 
for converting to or claiming Christianity. The same target that was on Mordecai and Esther's backs in Haman's days are still on the backs of some of our brothers and sisters in Christ today. But not all the hostility looks like that. Some of the hostility is more subtle. You're just considered ignorant, stupid, old-fashioned, like, like, uh, like you believe in fairy tales, superstitious. You're just dumb if you believe that God upholds the universe by the word of his power. Or if you believe that Jesus was God in the flesh who came and lived and died and rose again to save sinners like you and me. You're ridiculous to believe that the God of all that was and is and is to come would send his spirit to take up residence in his people so that we could claim God is in us and we are in him. There's a subtle hostility that just says, that's dumb. We don't want that kind of belief around. And I don't think, that, that's what Esther experienced in Esther chapter 2, when there was no target yet on her back, but she had to hide her identity as a person of God. And I think that subtle hostility can do the same kind of thing for us. I, I, let me just try to make it real. I think these hostilities are things that we actually experience. It's not just for someone else somewhere else. We experience this stuff. So I, I, I went on a mission trip to Rwanda one time. And on the way back, we had a several hour layover in Istanbul, Turkey. And just as we were getting ready to board the plane in Africa before our layover in Turkey, um, our team got news from the State Department here in the United States that a red alert had been issued for travelers and American citizens in Turkey. That meant there had been credible threats against Americans and you needed to lay low. So I'm not going to lie, that made us nervous, right? We get on the plane, we land in Turkey, and we stand out as Americans. Our t-shirts are in English, we just look like Americans, right? And so we get off our plane, we just keep our heads down, huddle together, we walked to our next gate, sat with our backs against the wall, and looked for any suspicious activity around us. Several hours, we wondered, who's got the target on our backs? And by God's grace, we got onto our plane without incident, and we left there. But what I felt for several hours on a layover is something that our brothers and sisters in Christ in certain places in the world feel every moment of every hour of every day. They live with targets on their back. Some hostility is just out in the open. We need to pray for them. Other hostility is not as out in the open. It's more subtle, and I think all of us experience that to some degree. Um, last year, I live on a cul-de-sac here in town, and, and last year, uh, one of my neighbors started a Facebook group for our cul-de-sac so we could all keep in touch. Great idea, I thought. So we joined the Facebook group, and a few months after it was created, um, somebody posted this picture. Christians keep moving. This is a heathen neighborhood. And the caption or the comment below it was, we should hang a sign like this at the entrance to our street. That's right here in Council Bluffs. That's not an open attack with a sniper laser pointed on my back. It's still a, a maybe not so subtle message that the people of God are not welcome here. We don't want you around, right? Keep on moving. That's my experience. My guess would be that every one of you have experienced some kind of hostility from your neighbors, from your coworkers, from your classmates, from your family. And so I thought I would close today with two encouragements to the people of God as we face hostility in this world. All right? Two encouragements. Here we go. Number one, facing hostility often means you are following Jesus. You cannot do the one without the other. Jesus tells us that's true. Here are his words. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. 
But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Friends, the truth is Jesus never promised his followers a life of all sunshine and rainbows, without conflict, without trials. That promise was never made. From Moses on his way out of Egypt, to Saul in the promised land, to Mordecai in exile, to Jesus in Jerusalem as he was sentenced to death, to to our friends, brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, to us right here in Council Bluffs, the truth stands, the world is a hostile place to people who are not of this world. We should expect that and know it. If we serve Jesus, and that was his experience, we are not greater than him. We will share in that experience. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. First encouragement, friends, when you face hostility, you are not alone. It's it's very likely evidence that you are following Jesus. Number one. Number two. The hostility of this world will fall and the glory of the next will rise. Just let that hit you for a moment. If Esther is a story of redemption that we see through falling and rising, I want to encourage you today, the hostility of this world will fall and the glory of the next will rise. It's a, it's a great reversal that God has promised, not just in the book of Esther, but throughout his scripture to all of his people. Let me show it to you in some verses. The first ones come from Romans. The Bible says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Catch this. Provided we suffer with him. We're brought low, a falling, in order that we may also be glorified with him. A reversal, a rising. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time that bring us low are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. A rising. Do you see the promise? Falling, rising, a reversal. The, the, uh, the hostility of this world will fall and the glory of the next will rise. It's in Romans. Let me show it to you again. This is 2 Corinthians. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. When you feel the scorn and the jokes and the mocking and you don't get invited to the things where people are having fun but they think you'll be the killjoy and you get left behind and left out and you get ridiculed and it feels like your outer self is wasting away because of your identity in Christ, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. The spirit of the living God dwells inside his people, regenerating, encouraging, guiding, protecting, empowering. For this light momentary affliction that brings us low is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, a a reversal beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Friends, I want to end today. Let's not look at the things that are seen. The plans of kings and nations, bosses and bullies, and think that they are the ones who are in control. Let's not be people who look at the things that are seen. Instead, let's be people who look at the things that are all too often unseen. The hand of God ordering the events of this world for his glory and the good of his people. The promises of God that stand strong and true through all times and cultures and challenges, they will not fail, not one of them will fall. The Spirit of God that takes up residence in His people, guiding and empowering and instructing and encouraging and sealing His people for the day that He returns The world is a hostile place for people who are not of this world, but praise God, 
He sent his son, Jesus, to overcome the world. And that is good news for us. Amen. Will you all pray with me? Awesome God, I thank you for this story in Esther, this account of your work. Uh, It seems like a dark passage, an annihilation decree on your people. And God, uh, the last verse says that after that decree was made, Haman and the king sat down to drink and the rest of the city was thrown into confusion. And God, I just know that sometimes the hostility of the world is just confusing. Why is this happening? God, why would you allow this? Where are you? How do I make sense of this? When will the hurt stop? Does anybody see me? It's confusing. It's got to thank you for books like Esther, for encouragements from Romans and, and 2 Corinthians, that you are not far off. You have not forgotten. You remember. You restore. You are in control. And you love your people to the end. God, for those of us who are facing the hostility of the world today, who are shaken by it, would you remind us who you are? That you are the sovereign God of all that was and is and is to come. That you know our days and that you have planned for us an eternal glory beyond compare. God, would you encourage us through the challenges of this life that we can lean on you, that we can know your power and your grace that's sufficient for us. And God, would you set our eyes on the things that we cannot see so that your grace is sufficient today and that one day we will get to look you eye to eye. Our faith will become sight. We'll no longer be subject to the kingdoms of this world because we will be subjects of the kingdom of heaven with you in your glory once and for all and forever. Oh, Jesus, would you speed that day and until that day comes, would you protect us as your people for your glory and our good, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.